Hello there and welcome to Functionally Fit. I'm Jen Rice and I am here today with a really special guest. Her name is uh, Nicole Olson. Nicole and I met not too long ago, but connected, I think, pretty instantaneously. And uh, her story really resonated with me. I felt like it was definitely something I wanted to share uh, with our audience. And I hope that you'll find um, her story to not only be inspiring, but something that you may want to share with, um, with others too. So welcome, Nicole. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, so Nicole, you're out in um, Boise, Idaho, right? Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, so how, how's the weather today? It's a, little it's, a little, it's a little cold, but it's sunny. I'm looking forward to going skiing tomorrow with all of our new snow. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. So, um, Nicole, you've been a physical therapist for 22 years, right? And then yes. um, you got into, though, more of a like a holistic approach to wellness um, based on your own personal story and I was I was hoping we could kind of kick off a little bit about um, you know your physical therapy work that you've done and then how you kind of have transitioned to you know just more of a holistic way of living and also helping others too with that way of living. Awesome well thank you so much for the introduction I'm so excited to be here. And I'm really excited to share my story because um, I think there's, um, in the world of medicine, we sometimes get very niched into, I'm, a, I'm an MD that does orthopedic surgery and, um, or a PA or whatever. And one of the things that I've really found over my many years of being a therapist is that I always say to my patients, 80% of pain is not physical, it's emotional. And, and this is something I found in my own life. And so through many years of kind of not being able to get people better, um, sort of started really looking um, much more holistically and addressing the whole individual. And I kind of want to step back just a little bit and kind of share my story. Um, so I'm 48 years old. When I was 14, I started throwing up. And so I am a recovered bulimic at this point. And um, I think it's, you know, so many women, we don't know how to handle our stress. And for me at 14, it was kind of a, I sort of stumbled into it. I was at a birthday party. We were passing around a wine cooler. We didn't know very much. We were sure we were going to get drunk off of our little two drinks of our wine cooler. And so somebody said, oh, let's go throw up. So our parents won't know we've had this drink. And in the process, I threw up a lot of cake. And I was like, ooh, hmm, I can eat more cake. That's kind of cool. Um, really having no idea what an eating disorder was. Um, and this for me, I was just unfortunately one of those individuals from that really perfect situation with a really, you know, uh, uh, we'll say a very controlling um, environment, uh, very high achieving. So I really ticked all the boxes for the eating disorder. And, um, and I continued to really struggle with an eating disorder well into my 20s. Um, and I, fortunately, my mom noticed that I was throwing up and got me into counseling and um, did she, did she notice, um, Nicole, did she notice right away or were there like many, a certain amount of, were you kind of pretty good at hiding it for a long time or? I was it, pretty good at hiding it for a long time. I was deeply into bulimia by the time she um, said, hey, you know, you're, I, I heard you throwing up. Mm -hmm. I mean, she really had to confront me because I really did hide it. Um, did you and, experience a um, significant uh, or a weight loss or an obvious something from 14 to 20, or I was just kind of bringing this up because, you know, for moms or dads out there that might be listening, like if they're. No, you know. I really didn't because in my case, I was binging a lot and because I was hiding it, I sometimes couldn't throw up uh, because I didn't want my mom to know or my dad to know. Um, so I actually, I actually put on weight Okay. during high school a little bit um and uh, you know i think though you know when you're a mom or a dad you you know how much food you buy and you know about how much your kids eat um but i would also do things like my girlfriend and i would walk down to wendy's pretty regularly and eat at their all you can eat salad bar and you know things like that like why is my child doing this sort of mm -hmm. sort of a thing 
Um, so yeah, there were a lot of there were a lot of clues. Also, just the food. I was constantly paying attention to what I ate. Uh, very, very structured with my eating. I spent hours and hours writing down all my food and how many calories it had. A very just, uh, you know, not health, not a healthy relationship with food at all. Right. And so this was probably because we're the same age. So this was probably, you know, you're coming of age in the late 80s. Um, and I know a lot of parents were really busy then the 80s were kind of like the booming 80s right and 90s yeah. um so and I know parents are busy today although you know maybe now with the last year people may be home a lot more but it is something that like you're saying it wasn't really an obvious outward sign so it's it's kind of like there's not really a a per like a, you can't really blame yourself if you don't catch it early. You can't really blame, you know, but I mean, can you, are there any particular signs that you would encourage people to, um, you know, look for or just open up more of a conversation? Is that kind of what you do with your um, clients too, or? Um, you know, because of, because of my world of being a physical therapist, I probably open the conversation more from the standpoint of, you know, what does your typical diet look like? Uh -huh. um, you know, how much water do you drink? And it's really, um, and again, I'm also working with women typically that are a lot my age. Uh -huh. And it's really amazing. Women are really want to talk about it. They don't, um, they, they often are, you know, they'll, they'll, very easily come out and share how they're binging or how they're, um, you know, they're purging or they're, you know, just really unhealthy relationship with food. Um, and are are you finding this in all people, even in all ages? Um, so, it's um, you know, I, I will say that I, again, the, the group that I typically work with is probably more in the age group of like 35 to 70 ish is mm -hmm. kind of the age group I sort of end up working with in my orthopedic practice. And um, so it's a lot of women my age who kind of did come to a, you know, we, we grew up in the 80s and the 90s where there was still this really, really thin ideal. Mm -hmm. um, so women are really very open to talking about it. And fortunately, like my, I have a 14 year old daughter who's almost 15 and they have a lot more body awareness about, um, you know, that bodies at every size are beautiful. Okay. And fortunately, you know, um, like my, my daughter, uh, we, we had this little funny conversation because I made a comment about her pants being, she needed some new pants. They were getting old and they were getting worn out in the bottom. And I made a comment about, did she need some new pants? And she's like, mom, my pants fit perfectly. I have a beautiful bottom. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. But how beautiful is that? That she just, she loves her bottom. And um, how much can we learn from our teenagers right now? Yeah, because I, I definitely suffered the um, self-inflicted body shaming, couldn't couldn't get thin enough, like for my high school year, especially towards, I remember like my senior year. And um, yes, it was like a poor relationship with food. I, I think you can emotionally, and I, the only thing I can think of with this, because, you know, as I got older, the you know, I realized that I was emotionally eating, but like the opposite way, um, mm -hmm. more eating, more eating, more sweets, eating more this. And that's where the heaviness can come on for a lot of us later in life. But back then I remember this feeling of like, I could, could possibly get thin enough, you know, yes. eating, you could live off frozen yogurt. Of course you can live off frozen yogurt, you know, who needs nutrients? Um, yeah. So I, I think that this, these campaigns we see now of different models of different sizes of different ages of different everything um, is really just so great to see, right? And I'm hopeful that it continues um, to be that way, like highlighting what is considered to be a healthy body, um, yeah. not something else, right? Absolutely. And I think even as a, you know, a quote unquote mature adult, um, it's been really valuable for me to um, even sometimes on social media to see some of these pictures of, you know, beautiful at every size and to really like to look at these women and realize they're my size and how 
I look at them and I'm like, wow, they're so, you know, fit and look so healthy. And I think, gosh, I'm that same size. And yet I'm still so hard on myself. Yeah. Um, so it's a beautiful thing to really, it, it can be a beautiful thing to look at, again, bodies of every size and really embrace that. And again, learn from our teenagers a little bit right now. Exactly. Um, I do catch myself though. I don't know. And I'll call myself out on this. Sometimes I'll see an ad of someone in underwear, let's just say um, that's heavier or, and I'm like, oh, whoa, like for a minute. And I think that's programming. Yes. Yeah. Right? You know, when we look at brain development, for example, and our, our, our hind brain is designed to keep us safe. So our primary thing with this hind brain is like, I need to be part of the group. And we've been socialized that being part of the group means being attractive. And our, our social construct of what attractive is for us was very thin. Mm -hmm. So our brain is like, you want to be part of the group. You want to be thin. Um, and we get to just sort of recognize like, oh, okay, this is going on over here. And I'm not going to choose to, to buy into that. I'm going to mm -hmm. choose to believe something different, but it is there. It is part of our biology. Um, and just, just recognizing that's there and saying, well, I, I'm not going to choose to, to indulge that. I love you. Thank you for trying to keep me safe. Um, yes. but we're going to go a different direction with this. Yeah. So, um, if you don't mind going into a little bit about, so your mother and you or your, they found that you needed some, you know, help yeah, with this so, and how did that unravel? You know, um, my mom offered me some counseling and um, she had gone and done some research and found another mom who had a daughter with an eating disorder and gotten a counselor. And initially I wouldn't go. Um, and fortunately or unfortunately, my girlfriend that I threw up with all the time, she got very, very sick. Um, she started throwing up blood. She, she got very sick and I got scared. Um, so I, at that point, asked my mom if I could start counseling and thank God for my counselor because uh, she saved my life. Oh. Uh, my mom could not have done that. Um, I needed professional help. Um, you know, even uh, I was, as I was getting ready for this, I was sort of thinking about what were some of those key moments in counseling that really changed things for me. And I remember my counselor asking me if I had any idea what hunger felt like. And I remember thinking like, no, I have no idea. I have no idea what it feels like to be hungry. Um, and, you know, doing exercises to re reconnect me with hunger and fullness. Mm -hmm. And, um, and she did a beautiful exercise with me one time where she had me stand up against a wall with like butcher paper and take markers and go down my sides and then walk her way and turn around and look. And it was just such a, a like an awakening of body dysmorphia because yeah. in my head, I was enormous. And there on that piece of paper, all of a sudden was someone who was not. And just realizing again, like, I don't actually see what is truth. Oh, that's um, powerful. Yeah. Yes. Wow. So that, that professional help was absolutely vital for me. And thank goodness my mother continued to push in that direction and knew she did not have the skill set to do that. Um, and I'll say that, you know, people always ask me, well, what was, what finally changed for you? Because body eating disorders have one of the highest mortality rates uh, and morbidity rates of almost any illness. And so I'm really one of the lucky ones that has been able to navigate this and move forward and actually feel really good about my body. I mean, not always, but, you know, I'm able to look in the mirror and be like, oh, I look good. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. You know, so uh, the last time I threw up, I was 30 years old and I was on my honeymoon and I was in Mexico. <laughs> like this most beautiful place in this moment that was supposed to be, you know, it was like the culmination of all these goals. I had found the man I wanted to marry. I was on this honeymoon and he and I had gotten into some sort of a little spat and I found myself, you know, throwing up. And I remember looking up and just thinking, I am supposed to be happy and I am not. And if I keep doing this, I am just in for this life of pain and I am not willing to live like this. And it was the moment where the pain finally got bigger than the payoff. 
and I just was like, I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. And that was really where I started doing even deeper work. I did some, went to some Anthony Robbins things, really looked at, you know, as an adult, okay, I'm out of my home. I'm not in a controlling environment anymore. I get to say what I need. And really the piece for me, the final puzzle piece was realizing that the throwing up was all about control. And it was about me not speaking my emotions. And I have had to learn that speaking my emotions, saying what I need. And I think for women so often, you know, to take this out to the 30,000 mile view here, Mm -hmm. when we look at pain, we look at dysfunctional eating, so often what is happening is we are swallowing our feelings. Yes, pushing it down. You know, we don't, sometimes we don't even realize what the feelings are. We just know we have them and we have this reaction and we go, put that down, put that stuff down. We're not handled, we're not, (laughs) we don't have time for that. And what happens is when we don't handle those emotions over time, they come out, they come out physically in pain. They come out in my case, it's an eating disorder. Um, And yeah, we, we really do get to learn how to say what we need. Um, and that, that is just been, um, and again, kind of circling back around to physical therapy for me and working with so many of my clients, um, so often just creating a space for people to express what they need and what's going on can, can do wonders for pain. Um, Yes. Yes. There's a lot of, um, the chronic pain, uh, you know, they even say any chron- chronic smoldering medical conditions, you know, can be deeply rooted in emotional issues. Um, I know in, in the Facebook group that I do, we, I do try to bring up, um, you know, in a respectful way you know, too, that, I mean, I want to tell everyone, everyone needs therapy. Everyone needs, you know, but maybe everyone does need therapy. I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> however, if you are struggling, if people are struggling with, with, with chronic pain, with a chronic illness, with depression, with anxiety, um, it is hard to fix on your own and mm-hmm. conventional medicine, allopathic medicine is just not really set up to handle, uh, really actually getting to the root cause and fixing it. Yes, we can give antidepressants and bipolar medications and all sorts of drugs and things. And of course there's therapists that do talk therapy and cognitive behavioral, but um, that would be more in line of someone that actually has time to spend with you. Whereas your primary care doctor generally doesn't have the kind of time to spend with you. It's just not set up for that. And I kind of, this is something, a theme I've brought up often on the podcast that in a 10 to 20 minute appointment, you're just not going to, you, you can't even, can, you can connect a lot with a patient, but you're probably not going to get past a lot of su- surface things. And you're certainly not going to wrap everything up and even begin to truly help people beyond prescription medications in that setting. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I think this, this kind of speaks to some ways into the shift in my own, in my own practice. And I have this beautiful gift of being a physical therapist in that I get to spend 45 minutes with my patients. And a lot of times, you know, I might be doing a manual technique and I might be, I'm talking to them the entire time. So, and I do this sometimes two or three days a week. So I really get to know these clients deeply. And, um, it, you know, and I use, um, I use a lot of uh, coaching, you know, coaching techniques in the world of therapy. But again, kind of one of the things I've noticed is I need to, to, to really truly get some of these people better. I need the space to do deep coaching. Um, yes. Now, obviously within the realm of physical therapy, that's not part of my practice, but um, one of the beautiful things in my separate, you know, coaching that I do with people is really being able to get into some of that, that stuff that creates our, our limitations in our world that keeps us from being deeply happy. Um, and um, 
so yeah just to kind of circle back around to, to that like you know I have a, I have a coach you know mm -hmm. I coach but yeah. I have a coach right, and right. uh yeah I think all of us have it's just part of the human condition. It's a beautiful thing. It's not a weakness. It's just, we all need a space where we get to just put it all out there and have somebody give us some objective, like, okay, awesome. And how can we move forward? Yeah, exactly. So when you're doing your coaching, um, is there a specific type of uh, uh, client that you work with on a regular basis or um, a certain, um, conditions. Um, I know some people will kind of niche a bit into, um, you know, types of healing work and or coaching. So can you just share a little bit about that too? Of course, in the show notes, we'll put, you know, ways you can learn more about what Nicole does. But um, I think that it's helpful to also hear a little bit about, um, you know, and if you wanted to give us an example of someone you've worked with and how that has helped them. Yeah, so I my kind of my niche, if you will, is intuitive eating. Um, mm -hmm. And this is kind of where I go in with people is moving away from that dieting mentality. 98% um, of uh, people who lose weight regain their weight within six months. So our current scarcity and deprivation model isn't working. Yeah. And um, so helping really helping guide women back to their own body, you know, mm -hmm. learning that that when am I hungry, uh, when am I full, what uh, nutrition feels good in my body, because what feels good to me and works for me is not the same thing that works for someone else. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's a so vegetarian- uniquely individual. You're exactly, right. exactly. Mm -hmm. And the way my, my body responds to carbs may be very different to the way somebody else's body responds to carbs. So there isn't a one size fits all. Um, so really working individually with women in that area, that's where, that's kind of where I tend to go in. And then as we get into that, we start looking at, you know, where are those places where we stress eat? And where are those places where we, you know, looking at all that stuff. So we get into that deeper limiting belief work, but we go at it through food. Excellent. That's fantastic. And so, um, I think one thing I was hoping that we could kind of end with here is um, you talk about being like a recovering perfectionist and, um, you know, I, I was hoping that maybe you'd, you'd give some tips to our listeners on, you know, just some practical ways, like, you know, being a perfectionist, um, a lot of people try to be there, right? I've definitely um, done that myself. I'm from a family of perfectionists. And it does create quite a bit of anxiety. It can create, um, you know, all sorts of, you know, fear of failure, um, fear of doing things that are new, all, you know, it's all sorts of things. So I was wondering if you might have some tips for anyone that listening about perfectionism and sort of, um, you know, just ways that maybe you could uh, help them to get started on sort of releasing a bit of that. Mm. Or if like there's one thing that you do daily to try to kind of like maybe it's a like an a certain affirmation or it's a certain journaling yeah. or I don't know if is there something that, is that you recommend? That's a juicy question. Yeah, I know, I know. Maybe yeah. So I think it's more like uh, if they to combat this feeling of needing to to be a perfectionist too. Like what would that what kind of things do you offer your clients for that? So I would say two things. Um, and this is just speaking from my own experience and, and in working with each client, we get to explore individually part of where that comes from. Yeah. Um, and again, for a lot of us who are perfectionists, part of our identity comes from our achievement. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that my worth and my value is in part because I achieve. You know, I show up, I make the meal, I have the perfect house, I have the job, all the things. Um, so some of it's looking at our individual uh, belief structure around that and recognizing where it's coming from a little bit. Um, and that yeah. our value, in fact, is not in our achievement. Our value is simply because we exist. We were born, we were put on this planet um, and we don't have to do anything to earn it. Uh, we we simply are valuable. Yeah. So looking that's at that a, a wonderful, bit. That's a wonderful tip because I, 
I know personally, my a lot of my identity was completely 100% wrapped up in, I was a dermatology PA. Mm -hmm. I, that's, that was my identity, 95%. But I was more than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we get to really look at that. And so in looking at that, I would say a couple of things there. One is that um, those little celebrations, those daily little celebrations about ourselves, like just acknowledging ourselves for what we do and how we show up. And it can be something like, wow, I was on time to get my 15 year old from practice today and I had 25 other things going on. Good job, me. Um, so just those little celebrations. Um, and then you asked about like a daily affirmation. I have a, you, you would laugh. I have these, all these little three by five cards that are all stuck on my cabinet in my bathroom. And they're my sort of my daily things I look at. And one of them is my belief about failure. Um, and I actually, I actually stole this from Tony Robbins, but it is, I only fail when I fail to learn. I set up my conditions for failure. It's really hard for me to fail now. Because as long as I learn something, I cannot possibly fail. So, um, you that's, know, and that's I, powerful because fear of failure is a huge thing that holds people back from doing almost anything new and then daily taking uncomfortable steps. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That In that world of perfectionism, um, I find I don't want to do things if I think I'm not doing them perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, so I, how I tackled that was going after the limiting belief that created it, which was, you know what, I can't, I can't fail. I cannot fail unless I fail to learn. And there's always something to learn. Gosh, that, that's beautiful. That's a great place for us to uh, kind of put a pin in it. And we awesome. so, so appreciate you being here. I think that, you know, the work that you're doing is, um, you know, in incredibly valuable um, for, for your clients. And then sharing today here, um, is, is hopefully helpful to someone who may be struggling. Um, if you are, you can always check the show notes. Um, I'm sure you have resources for people. Otherwise, if for, for some reason you feel like they may need something else. Yes. Um, but we so appreciate feedback too on the podcast. Um, we do have a voice, I think it's a voice message option where you can actually leave us uh, some comments that way. And if you can subscribe to our channel. It's always helpful to kind of move us forward. But Nicole, thank you so much for being here. We so, so appreciate it. 